All right, okay. Oh, now, where am I? Okay, so we're gonna go on to the message now. We're gonna talk about something called sozo. So if, if you could flip up the, there we go, the, the sermon message slides. We're gonna talk about this. Oh, I gotta settle down. All right, the, and the deal is, is that, you know, when you read scripture, now, I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard me say it before. When you go to the, read the Bible, you should always pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what the Spirit of God wants you to get out of reading the Word. Because the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit really knows what Holy Spirit intended, right? I mean, that's, that's what's there. And sometimes, you know, with the distance in time from when these things were originally written either in, you know, all the way back to Genesis and, you know, Moses and then the Old Testament prophets and the Psalms and even into the New Testament. There's a lot of time difference there. And so sometimes we have to think about things, you know, what does this mean in our world? To understand that, we need to think about what it meant in that time frame, what it meant in that world, and how does it apply to us. And you know, because the Word of God is something that's alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. You know, it you know divides the bone from the marrow, and it it just knows exactly what the intent is in our lives. There is so much there in the Word of God, but sometimes you know we have to let the Holy Spirit inspire us. What do you want me to get out of this, Holy Spirit? And on top of it, sometimes we have to understand, what in the world does this mean? And so we're going to talk about something called sozo. Now, when it's transliterated into English, it comes across as S-O-Z-O. But when it's pronounced in Greek, there's, there's a D in there <clears throat> because the Greek letter is a, is a double letter. So when I say it, you're going to hear me say it as if it's a Greek word, you know, in the, in the original language, in the biblical language, even though it looks a little different in English. Okay, so we're going to talk about sozo. And sozo is, you know, one of those things that can have a variety of meanings, all of which apply to us today. And so I was reading the book of 1 Timothy a few days ago, and I come across this, this scripture. And I'm going, now what in the world does that mean? You know, where it's like, he's, you know, Paul is writing to Timothy, and, you know, he's saying... Keep a close watch on yourself, right? And teach, and you keep doing that and persist in it, you know, be consistent in it, and you're going to save yourself, and you're going to save other people. And I'm going, well, what in the world could that mean? Because certainly not preaching is salvation, and certainly not you're saving yourself by the activities that you do. What is this supposed to mean? And, I, I, you know, the simple answer is that you don't get saved by you know, talking and preaching. God works through those things to do that. <clears throat> but I'm trying to understand what does this mean. So I go start looking stuff up a little bit, and I go, what, what does this word save mean? And this is an example of sozo. And, you know, and so we need to go understand what this means because it applies to us today. And it applies greatly to us. But, you know, it was one of those things that, well, I had to go figure out a little bit. But here, here's this definition of this word. And this is a common word in the New Testament. This is not some esoteric you know, thing. I'm not trying to give you a Greek lesson or anything like that. This is stuff that applies to us. And so sozo is this uh, used word that means to preserve or rescue from natural danger, affliction, save from harm, to set free from disease. It's like to go in there to prosper and thrive. And it's, it's more than just getting by. It's more than just, hey, you know, you're saved from hell and stuff. There's more to it than that. You know, it's to preserve from eternal death. It's to, you know, bring to salvation. But the, it, the way things work in the Bible, a lot of times you can have a word used and it can mean more than one thing at the same time. And that's the way it's used in the Gospels a lot of times. And it's used in Paul's letters that way too. You can be saved in terms of your salvation, you know, by faith in Jesus, but at the same time, God intends to save you over time as you go through this Christian life from all these dangers and problems and sin and, you know, things that beset us, things that are problems in our lives. And so we're going to see how this applies 
to us and what do we do from this. But this goes all the way back to the beginning. So let's, let's talk about it. in the book of Matthew. You know, the book of Matthew, uh, the angel appears to Mary, right? And the, the angel is talking to Mary. Well, I'm mean, talking to Joseph, I'm sorry. The angel had appeared to Mary and told her what was going to happen. But then the angel appears to Joseph in a dream. And so we're in the, the, the Joseph's dream. You know, just like the angel had appeared to Mary and stuff. But now in Joseph's dream, the angel says, you know, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife because that which is in her uh, is conceived from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, which means the Lord saves, by the way, Yeshua. For he will save his people from their sins. Okay, and all this took place as spoken through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. But the point that we want to understand here is, is so God is speaking to Joseph. There's something different going on. There's something special here that Jesus will save his people from their sins. Now, our, our passage that we're going to focus on today is in 1 Timothy. But I want to ask you today, do you need that kind of sozo in your life? Do you have some kind of problem with sin that's challenging you in your life today? And what I'm going to say is the presence of God like during worship or other things, you can go to God and God can touch you with that. He can save you from that. The Word of God says how that can be, how that can happen, as in you need to crucify that thing, put it to death, you know, stop living in the flesh and live in the Spirit and follow the Spirit of God. But Jesus came to do that. He's the one that makes that power possible, you know, through the death on his on the cross, through the suffering of Jesus. By the stripes of Jesus, we're healed, right? You know, by the wounds of Jesus, another translation would say. And so, Jesus came to save people. But it's more than just what you might hear in churches, some churches today, where it's like, oh, all there is about salvation is about Jesus died on the cross, and if you accept him, then you're saved. And then people get this mistaken impression then that the rest of life is I just sit in the pew and I struggle through life. Struggle with sin, struggle with this, struggle with that, you know, and just, you know, and there's nothing else. There's a whole lot more else because God intended us to have an abundant life. He tended to save us from these things that affect us in the world today. He's, he called us to a higher standard, to a higher life, you know, where we might have life and have it abundantly. And so if you talk now about the, the woman who had the issue of blood, and Jesus is going through on the way to Jerusalem here, and, you know, and the uh, guy came up and said, hey, you know, come pray for my daughter and stuff. And then, you know, you've heard the story a few times, I'm sure. But this, here's this woman. She's been suffering for 12 years. She has this problem. It isn't just this female problem she's dealing with. It's the social issues that she's dealing with. Because remember, then, in the society, you know, this is one of the things that would make you ritually unclean and unable to participate in synagogue, unable to, you know, participate fully in the temple, unable to do things in life because you have this ritual issue. And so she's been doing more than just suffering from medical treatment. It's suffering emotionally and society-wise. But she said, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. I will be made sozo. Okay? That's the verb there. This will make me well. This will make, this will solve my problem. Remember, it's not just a medical issue here. Now, other people, this was a crowd. People were touching Jesus. Jesus was in this crowd and stuff. And the Gospels tell us that he said, well, who touched me? And they're like, the apostles are like, well, goodness, there's all these people around. You know, everybody's touching you. What do you, you, know, what do you mean, who touched you? And he's looking to see who touched him, right? Because she had come up there to touch him to 
you know, because I can be made well. But remember, that's all it took. Now, she caused him to be ritually unclean. Remember that. I mean, remember what I'm saying is that this is this is the society that they're living in. This is the the thing under the you know, the old you know law, the sacrificial law, and so Jesus is trying. He has to deal with more than just the physical healing here. He's dealing with her well-being, her emotional well-being, her mental well-being, because he doesn't want her to walk away thinking, "Oh, I'm healed." but I've made him, the Lord, unclean. Remember, this is the thought process. So you've got to deal with this, too, not just the physical healing. This, this sozo thing is a holistic health, a holistic healing, and not just one little thing, right? And so, you know, in the Matthews version of it, it's pretty short. You know, you go to the other Gospels, they, they, they explain more in there. But the Jesus turned and seeing her said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has saved you. Or in this case, had made you well, the way this is translated. It could be translated either way. Remember, you know, you've been made well, but it saved you from this guilt, saved you from this problem, saved you from this health issue. It's made you well. And from that hour is the literal translation. You know, this English Standard Version says instantly the woman was made well. But from that time on and continuing on, the sense of the language is that she was made well and stayed well. Okay? So she was healed. But it wasn't just this physical thing. Now, like I said, you know, we were... The, 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 the message today was supposed to be 1 Timothy. But there's something here that in going through this, and you know, I really feel strongly about this right now, but there's somebody here, and you need that kind of sozo in your life. I'm telling you, imploring, and <laughs> begging might be too strong, but it might be close to that. I'm just like... Reach out and touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. Reach out and touch Jesus. It doesn't have to just be the hem of the garment. Because He loves you. He cares for you. He wants fellowship with you. And you have something. I don't know who this is. Okay. I'm not thinking anybody in particular. Somebody here. You, you have this thing that you feel like you've done or something has separated you from God. You have a need. You have a healing that you need. It's not just physical. There's some emotional, mental thing. You have something just like this woman reached out and touched the hem of the garment. And I'm asking you, go to God and touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. Be made whole be made well from now and on. And so I, I'm gonna, we're, we're going to pray right now but, because I just really feel strongly that this is what we need to do. And if you're, the, if you're somebody who you need to reach out and make a touch with Jesus, a connection with Jesus, now's the time to do it. Lord God, I, I, I really feel the Spirit of God impressing me that there's somebody or some bodies here who need this touch. Typically, we talk about people needing a touch from God. But right now, this is a thing we need to reach out and touch you. So Jesus, we reach out and touch you because we know that you love us and you've called us to do this and that the power of God may flow into us. Just like this scripture where you felt the power had gone out from you to bring healing to this woman. And I pray that whoever it is here that needs that healing touch, that you supply that power as they reach out to you in faith, believing that they shall be made well. Because the woman came to you in faith, in amongst all of that crowd, to touch you. 
made her way through that, even though there was opposition roadblocks of trying to get through, because she knew that that's the solution to her problem in life. And you made her well, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. You set her free. And we thank you for that, Father, for setting us free, each and every one who needs your touch. Thank you for that, Jesus. Okay, so if you said that prayer, really, it was you, you needed that, keep that in mind that God really cares and He's setting you free from that. Whatever that challenge and difficulty is. And there are people here who need physical healing. And there's some people here who need more than physical healing. Now let's look at Sozo from a different perspective. You know, now you have Peter. A lot of people kind of get down on Peter sometimes because Peter is brash and he speaks out and says stuff when he shouldn't have. His wife probably told him, oh, well, you know, and Peter did have a wife, okay? You know, probably told him, you know, Peter, I'm so frustrated with you. You're always saying stuff when you shouldn't talk, all right? You're talking too much. You rat me out. You do this, you do that, you know? You know, so the deal is, is that Peter can be like that. So Peter is like there, you know, all that time. But Peter's also the only one sometimes who's the only one who stepped out in faith and made these statements and proclamations of who is what Jesus is. And, and not was, but is. And so they're in the boat, and Jesus is walking on the water. You know, and this is one of those passages, by the way, people like... I'm going to digress for a little. This is a rabbit trail, but that's okay. So I'm going to chase this rabbit because, you know, sometimes people get into this thing about how do you, you know, do your daily devotions or how do you get close to Jesus? When do you do your Bible study and stuff? And people get into this thing about, oh, you got to have this hour in the morning or 30 minutes, five minutes, two minutes, whatever it is, but it's got to be in the morning because Jesus prayed in the morning. He got up, went out, and prayed in the morning. Okay, so they kind of get this legalistic thing. It has to be this way. Well, guess what? Jesus prays in the evening too, right? <laughs> well, you think about that. You know, here it is. He sent them out on the boat, and he went up, dismissed the crowds, went up in the hills and prayed, and then he came back down, and he's walking on the water. And it's at night. So he'd been praying in the evening. Uh, and now they're going to be like, oh, now you have to do both. You have to have this thing in the morning. You've got to put rules around it. This is a churchy thing, right? You know, this is the way people, people, you've got to establish rules is what people think. So you've got to do it in the morning. Now you've got to do it in the evening, too. Oh, yeah, you got, yeah. No, you pray. What works for you? What's God calling you to do? God's not that legalistic. He loves us. He cares for us. And when we pray and talk to God, he likes that fellowship. Whether it's the morning or the afternoon or the meeting, you know, or the middle of the night. Now, personally, you know, I pray before I get up. You know, alarm clock goes off. I hit the snooze button, not to go back to sleep, in theory. But, you know, I pray before I get out of bed. Okay? That doesn't mean you have to do it. That doesn't mean that's the only way it has to be done. I'm not trying to say it that way. But I'm saying, I do that for a little bit anyway. Right? Because I know me, I am all doofed up, that if I don't do that, I will just have a doofy day. Just, you know, I'll say things, I'll do things, whatever. You know, Bonnie said they're going, yeah, you do things up whether you do that or not. But that happens too. But it would really be worse if I didn't pray in the morning before I got up. Okay? Because I'm human. And so we pray in the morning. And then I pray, I read scripture. Bible before I go to bed because I want that to be the last thing on my mind because your brain tends to dwell on this stuff. It's better than watching Star Trek. It's better than watching um, what, what, is it, what is it new show that we don't get because we don't have cable? Mandalorian or something. You know, you know if you want to dwell on that, if you want that to be the thing that dwells in your head and when you sleep, fine. You know, but I'm telling you, reading scripture is a good thing. You know, but I don't want you to get legalistic about it, okay? You know, reading the Bible. And reading some number of passages of chapters every day and thinking, oh, i, I got to get through the Bible 18 times in a year. i got to read it every month. Or, you know, those are human things. 
What I'm saying is, read the Scripture. Get something out of it. Let it dwell in your hearts richly. It'll change us, you know. You know, the Word of God says, let your behavior change based upon your renewed mind, right? How do you renew your mind? You renew your mind with the Word of God. And so that'll change us, right? Anyway, okay, enough of that rabbit trail. We're back on the main trail, and we're hunting deer now. And he said, so Peter's in the boat, and all the other disciples are in the boat. Jesus had been praying up in the hills in the evening, and he's coming down, he's on the lake, you know, and they're, they're scared. And, you know, he's, you know, uh, and so Jesus is walking on the water, and they're like, oh, who is this? He said, and so Peter said to him, Lord, if, it's, if it is you, I'm, I always thought this was curious. If it is you, command me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. You know, this is command imperative type voice. If you, you go read the language, it's a comparative saying. He says, come. So Peter got out of the boat and starts walking on the water. And, you know, I don't know how he sees the wind, but that's what the Word of God says. He sees the wind. I think he sees the effect of the wind, the blowing spray and the spume on the waves and stuff. The Sea of Galilee, you know, can get rough at times. And he's, he's you know, he gets afraid. And he cries out, Lord, sozo me. Lord, save me. So Jesus reached out and saved him while to keep him from sinking under the waves. And so the deal is, so you see how sozo, it, we talked about how it can Let's back up a little bit. Jesus came to save his people from their sins, right? And the woman with the issue of blood, she was made well. So, so, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, from that point on, okay? There's something going on here. Peter, who already had faith in God, remember he's the one who declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, now it's reach out, save me, Lord, okay? You can call out to God and he'll save you, right? He's, he, he hears his people. He always will hear them. Right. Now, in the book of Titus, Paul is writing this thing to Titus. He's talking about Jesus. That's the he here. Jesus saved us, sozoed us. Now, we're talking about salvation, right? From eternal damnation type of salvation type thing. But he saved us. There's a different word in Scripture for salvation, by the way. But this is what it's talking about here. It, not because we did this work, Right? It's not because we did works of righteousness. Oh, no. It's, it can't be you know, works of righteousness. Uh, the, the word in my Bible, he saved us, not because of works done by us, by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus saves us. Remember when... When, when we're saved, you know, from eternal death, right? God is saving us through His Son. But our hearts are made new. We're regenerated, recreated, you know. So, so in Genesis, the beginning, okay? You now have a regeneration. Remember, there, there's, a, there's a consistency in this root of... Genesis, generation, germination, you know, the gener so you're regenerated, you're renewed, you are reborn, you're a new creature. You know, behold, all things are new, the old is past, the new has come. So we're regenerated, and this renewal is of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit starts working in our lives to renew us. That doesn't mean that we do nothing. We can just live like pagans and God changes us. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to be renewed. But he conforms us to the image of Jesus. That's all part of this salvation thing. That's how people can say, and the Scripture can say, that we have been saved, we're being saved, we will be saved, this sozo thing, because the Holy Spirit is renewing us and working us, saves us through these, from these calamities in life and protects us and renews us as we go along. So we're saved through this, through the, through the blood of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. So now 
I know I'm running short on time. But the, the issue is, is, so now, how does this apply to us? Okay, so we're going to go back to 1 Timothy, and I'm going to go through this faster than I thought I would have. But the issue is, is if in 1 Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 6, okay, so Paul is writing to Timothy about how these things go. Remember, this is what's leading into that thing where I said, okay, about the salvation thing. You know, what does this mean? If you continue to do these things, you will save others. The reality is Jesus is the one who saves, but he sometimes does it through people and usually does it through the ministering of people. It's that old story, you know, you may have heard, you know, about the guy who is, you know, his boat capsized, he's floating around in the water, and he's calling on God to save him and to set him free, right? And, you know, he's floating on the water, Jesus is going to save me, I have faith. You know, and the boat comes by and said, hey, come on, I'll pick you up and take you to shore. Oh, no, Jesus is going to save me. I I'm, I'm have faith. Jesus is going to save me. All right, the helicopter comes by and see, you know, sees the wreckage and puts the swimmer in the water. I'll pick you up, take you to shore. No, 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 you don't have to rescue me because Jesus is going to take care of that. You know, and it goes on. And then, you know, finally he drowns because he wears out and he drowns. And he gets to heaven and... Oh, God, Jesus, why didn't you save me? I had faith. I called on your name. He said, you know, I sent the boat. You know, you had a life jacket. I had, you know, I sent the helicopter. And, you know, he works through his people. Okay? God works through his Now, he, God does do miracles not through his people. I mean, that, that does happen. There's no doubt. But what we're talking about in this passage is how he works through individuals in their lives. Okay, so if you put these things before the brothers, this is Paul writing to Timothy, put these things before the brothers and the sisters. Okay, you know, I have to say this, where it says before the brothers, it's not just talking about the men guys, okay, not the men types alone. You know, in Greek, when it is a masculine plural, the way the biblical language, Greek, Hebrew, and a bunch of other languages, not so much English because English is different, not better, different. You know, when you have a masculine plural like this, it's a collective, and it means men and women at the same time. So brothers and sisters would be a proper and correct translation. A lot, modern translations footnote this all over the place. And anyway, the idea is, is that you put these things before the brothers, and you'll be a good servant of the Lord. And being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine. So the idea is, Timothy, you can't just go out and spout what you want. You can't just do what you want. You need to be trained in the Word of God. You need to know what the Word of God says and what it really means. You can't just be believing whatever you hear in the world because the world corrupts the Word of God, changes it to what they want it to be, it's a, and it'll lead people astray. You know, it's kind of like that thing. Have you ever heard anybody say that God helps those who help themselves? You ever heard that? Is that in the Bible? No, it's not. If you didn't answer that, you need to go read your Word of God. So do you know that that's not in Scripture? Okay? God, it, it says God helps those who call on the name of the Lord. He wants to help those who call on Him. Right? But anyway, you need to be trained in the word of faith and doctrine, the good doctrine, correct things, the things that God teaches. Doctrine, dogma, and stuff like that is stuff that sh should be based upon Scripture and should be what God has taught and God says and God expects from the Old Testament, from Genesis on through the thing. Remember that when this was being written, there was no New Testament. Their Scripture was Torah. The scripture was the Psalms and the prophets, or what we call the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh. That's what they used for the scripture. And they used the Greek version, generally, because that was the common language around the world at the time. <clears throat> and so the idea here is, is that are you trained in the word of God? Are you trained in the good doctrine of the faith? Anyway, he goes on to say, don't get distracted by these silly myths. In other words... You get the local religions adding stuff into Christianity and stuff like that, what we would today call synergism, but, um, or syncretism, rather, syncretism. 
where, you know, you're bringing things in that are not really biblical and stuff. You know, or you get into this thing about, well, you have to do things a certain way and you create all these rules in, in a church that really don't have anything to do with faith. You know, you know, you, and I'll just go ahead and step on some denominational toes or whatever. We're a non-denominational church, so I can do that, right? You know, but non-denominational churches can be just as bad. You've got all these unwritten rules about how you should behave and how you should dress and what you should do. It's kind of like these things. Oh, did you see what they were wearing? I could see her knees. Oh, you know, evil. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, and if you remember Lost in Space, you know, the, the, the robot out there going, danger, Will Robinson, danger. You know, the, you know, the, People get into that kind of thing that's like, well, why did you see your knees? Well, because they had cuts in their jeans and you could see through them. And why is that a problem? Well, 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 who would wear stuff like that? You get out of your, you, you're locked in this box. Get a bigger world, you know? So what if they like to cut holes in their jeans? If they like to waste the money, go ahead, let them. You know, I'm sorry, if you wear holes in your jeans, if you like to wear holes in your jeans, go ahead. It's not bothering me. I, <laughs> a few years ago, Parker and Maria gave me a Christmas a present. It was a pair, new pair of Wrangler blue jeans. I, I'm happy with this. I can get rid of those jeans that have holes in them now I, that I've been using to mow the lawn. I mean, you can see things. But they were blue jeans, and they did the job. I'm wearing them, and there's nobody around. Anyway, who cares? You know, and they were looking like at each other like, you have Levi's that have holes in them, and you want to get rid of them? Why would you do that? You could sell those for money. I already cut them up for rags. What, well, you might need to sell it for money. You know, the, the deal is, is that <clears throat> that's the way people think. And so, is that a problem? No, that's some irrelevant, silly thing that we create these rules and these myths that uh, get us distracted. No, don't. If you want to wear jeans with holes, fine. If you don't, fine. I had a lady here uh, a while back, you know, when they were doing the homeschool education stuff here on Thursdays this last year. You know, she, she was going to be one of the teachers and leaders. She came to the church. Is it okay if I wear jeans inside the church? Well, yeah. Why would that be a problem? And then I was, oh yeah. There's some churches where, ooh, it's verboten to wear jeans in the church. It's verboten to wear shorts. It's verboten to, you know, you don't have a dress that goes down to, you know, drags on the dirt. You know, I just, and, you know, it's crazy the way we do things. You know, what are you going to do? Next, we're going to have all the women in churches wear burkas. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, that's silly. You know, it's, but people get into these rules, right? I'm sorry if I've offended you with, you know, your denominational background, so, you know. But the, the deal here is, is that don't, it, it, the Word of God says, have nothing to do with irrelevant things. Focus on the faith. Focus on the relationship. This is about relationship with Jesus. That's what Christianity is all about, you know, is the relationship with Jesus Christ. And faith in Him. Walk with Him. Let Him connect us. Now, I have to go back and make sure that everybody understands. It's okay to wear a dress to church, right? You don't have to wear jeans. You can wear a dress if you're a lady type, right? <laughs> if you're a bad type, if you're a bad type and you feel you really need to do that, come on to church because I'd rather have you in church than somewhere else. You know, the deal is, is if you need Jesus, you need Jesus. I don't care what you're wearing. I don't care if you wear shorts. I don't care if you dye your hair purple. I, no, I'm sorry. You know, back there. I didn't beat it that way. You know, she's back there with the purple hair color. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I didn't mean it in a bad way. Because I really don't care if you dye your hair purple. I don't care if you're bald, okay? You know, the deal is, is that... It, now, if you could take purple color and color your skin purple on top, you know, that might be neat. But uh, how did I get to this point? They, <laughs> so the deal is, 
God is more worried about our relationship with Jesus than all those external things, right? And so the deal is, is don't get involved with irrelevant silly mess. Train yourself for godliness. In other words, you train yourself. It's a command statement in the Word of God. We don't just lollygag through life and think God's going to change us if we live like a pagan and all of a sudden we're going to end up being conformed in the image of Christ. We have to make a decision to train ourselves. How do you do that? You do that through scripture, through prayer, through worship, fellowship with believers, pursuing godliness, quiet time with God, time in silence before God to let God change us. We train ourselves with godliness. But don't be legalistic about it because... There isn't a bunch of set rules that say, you do this for so many minutes a day and you will suddenly become holy. That's not the point. The point is, are you in relationship with Jesus and are you doing what he calls you to do to train yourself for godliness? Okay? All right. Enough. All right. Now, bodily training, you know, it has value. I mean, this, this is, I, I was surprised, you know, when I'm going through, you know, this stuff at, you know, in the School of Divinity, how much emphasis the school was putting on to ministers to take care of themselves physically. You know why? Because you have some that work themselves to death, and then you have some that don't take care of themselves. They don't take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. They don't take care of their bodies, you know, and, you know, they just, they're not good representations of Jesus because, you know, they're just, just, you know, and, you know, if you do nothing but eat donuts and drink beer every day, eventually you're not going to be healthy, you know. Yeah, you know, let's just put it in an extreme on one side, right? You know, so you take care of yourself. So bodily training is a value, but those people who get into this hyper healthy things, you know, you know, I got no fat on my body. Well, you're going to die. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, because you have no reserves. Your body isn't intended to be that way, to have zero fat, okay? You get professional athletes, they get down to like 4% body fat. Well, you know, like some of the professional football players and stuff like that, they have professional nutritionists working with them weekly or more frequently about what they eat, how they exercise, and they're being monitored. They weigh in, they do this, they do that, they take blood tests because they're optimizing themselves, but they're being watched so that they don't get into an unhealthy state. All right? If you don't know that, go look it up. But the issue is, is that, you know, you have this thing about bodily training is of some value. But, you know, I, I get into, you see these people, they're out there and they're drinking all these, you know, special shakes and special stuff and they're building themselves up. Well, what is this? Bodily training is of some value, but godliness is in value of every way. If you take that kind of effort and think about train yourself, right? And I'm going to train myself physically. I'm going to put some effort, just like when I go to the gym and work out, or I go to the, my Nautilus that I have in the garage, or I have the this or the that, or whatever that the clothes are hanging on because we don't actually use it all the time, you know, you know, if you have one of those exercise machines. You know, but if you do that, if you think godliness has promised in the present life and also in the life to come because Jesus said we'll be rewarded for what we do, right? You know, we have this stuff, so godliness impacts others. You know, it impacts and people are drawn into the kingdom of God. If we live a godly life and we represent Jesus well, it attracts others. Not legalistic thing about slapping on people, but living an actual godly life that exudes love and fellowship and relationship that draws people in to the presence of God. It draws people in. And it brings in these miraculous things that come with it, the changes in life, the healings that take place, the re rejection of sin and that destroys us. Those are things that bring people into the kingdom of God and it brings things into eternal life. And so <clears throat> Paul is saying this, this saying is trustworthy <clears throat> and deserving of full acceptance. It's true. Because that's what Timothy and Paul strive to work on, you know, and we have the, they had their hopes set on the living God, and that's why they, where they put their efforts, so that people could change their lives. Remember, just like today, they're living in a pagan world, and they're pulling people out of 
self-destructive things, you know, paganistic things, things that are not just physically damaging but spiritually damaging and taking them into the kingdom of darkness. They're pulling them out of the kingdom of darkness, putting them into the kingdom of light. And so they're toiling and striving to bring people to the living God. And so this is what Paul is talking about, that we can be saved. And if Timothy is out there setting an example, living a godly life, preaching and teaching the right things, it brings people to the kingdom of God. It brings people in relationship with Jesus. They still have to have their own personal faith in Jesus as part of that sozo, but it's what brings them into the kingdom of God. Remember, so it says... Set the believers an example in conduct and love and faith and purity. You set an example for people by the way you live. And we all, each and every one of us, are setting examples for the people around us. If you're living one way on Sunday morning and you're living another way on Monday, you're setting an example. And that may not be a good example. God calls us to live consistently. To live consistently. But remember, God's calling us to do that. God isn't up there with a big wooden spoon, as they say, ready to whack you when you mess up. That's just not the way God is. Now, if you get into sin and doing everything, there's going to be consequences because of the sin. But God loves you, and He wants you to avoid those consequences. He wants you to avoid those problems for our own benefit. Okay, anyways, be an example in speech and conduct until, you know, until I come. That is, you know, Paul's come, going to come visit Timothy. At least he intends to. I don't know if they ever got out of prison to be able to do that or not. But devote yourself to script, reading Scripture, the exhortation and the teaching. Remember, many of the people in the pagan world Timothy is dealing with or were illiterate, right? Not all of them, but many of them. And uh, the, the Jews in Galilee and stuff like that were far more educated, knew more languages, and could read better than most people in today's world assume. But the places where Timothy would be in Ephesus, a lot of those people would be illiterate. Remember, the church in those places would often be a mix of people who were actually currently slaves, could have landholders in there. You could have people from all stratas of society, both Jews and Greeks and all kinds of people mixed together in the church. And, you know, he needed to be able to deal with all of them and be able to read scripture and to teach and explain what all of this means. But also, don't neglect what was given. God imparts gifts to people. God imparts gifts to all of us. You all, all of us, have gifts that God has given us. Right? And we're to use them for the kingdom of God. There's all kinds of different gifts. It's not just some little list. Sometimes people want to say, oh, the Bible in passage so-and-so says, here's a list of gifts. Okay, yes, those are a list of gifts. But God has many gifts. If you go through all the scripture, there's many things that God gives us the ability to do. But the idea here is, is that there is a gift. If you think God has something for you and you want prayer and you want to have hands laid on you to be able to have that gift come, be manifest and come forward, then we can do that. Let the elders pray for you and you know, that God reveal to you what his giftings are that he has in store for you. But Paul tells him, practice those things. You don't just receive it. You've got to practice it and use it and make it happen. And, and you see where it says in there, immerse yourself in them so that people can see how you're progressing in the faith. That's part of setting an example. If you're, if you're a believer, you should be progressing in the faith and becoming more and more and more Christ-like. And you should be able to advance in what you're doing and the gifts that God has given you. And, you know, if you're a business person and God has given you gifts in terms of administration, uh, be able to deal with accounting. Oh, accounting. Oh, gosh. I hate accounting. The, the issue, the only B I ever made in graduate school, and all those, you know, MBA, degree in theology, and biblical studies, and divinity. The only B I have ever made is accounting. 
It's whoever came up with that stuff. Oh, you know, but the deal is, if God has blessed you with that ability, use that gift to his glory to advance the place where you're working, to make your company successful, to make your boss successful. That's the kind of thing God calls us to do. Immerse yourself so that you people may see your progress, right? Make it happen. God's given you the ability to do that. If you can hit a baseball, all the more blessing to you, hit that baseball, right? Okay, but God's given you abilities. Okay. So we're going to wrap this up. I know I'm going a little long today. The issue is, is God saves us. How does he save us? All kinds of different ways. But when we work through this and use the gifts God given us, it gives God the, to use his plan to work through his people to bring people into the saving relationship with Jesus. Not just internal salvation, but also physically, emotionally, mentally, all of these things to set them free, to set them free from bondage, to redeem them, to pick them up out of the, as they say, the miry clay, out of sin, out of all these other problems. And so Paul's encouraging Timothy to do that, and it encourages us to use what God has given us to, to build up other people and help God be able to save them through our words and actions and deeds. So let's stand. We'll close out.